Hey there, my Medical Wildcats. I'm Joseph Guggenheim. I'm a 1972 alum of the medical school. And this month's presentation is going to be on the Century of Progress World's Fair. I call this Chicago's Other World's Fair because a lot of people are familiar with the 1893 Columbian Exposition World's Fair, which was well known. This was uh, erected to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Columbus's voyage. And it showed that Chicago had recovered from the 1871 fire and what was called the depression of 1873, also called the long depression because by some metrics it went into the 1890s. The fairgrounds will be remembered as the white city because the buildings were covered with white plaster. The buildings were done in classical architecture. Only one building now remains and that is what was originally the Palace of Fine Arts now the Museum of Science and Industry. The fair was popularized in the 2004 bestseller book, The Devil in the White City. Well, why should we have a World's Fair? Well, uh, they've been called the World's Universities. Uh, they're done for entertainment and education. Lately, they're mostly entertainment. World's Fairs have been classified in three eras, industrialization, cultural exchange, and nation branding were the most recent ones. The first World's Fair was the Great Exhibition of London in 1851, which was held in the largely glass Crystal Palace. This chart shows the difference between the 1893 and the 1933-34 fairs. The 1933 fair was actually continued into 34. You can see the attendance was higher in the 33-34 fair, but that was because it went two seasons. Each season by itself was not as large as the 1893 fair. Both fairs were profitable. However, the 1933-34 fair was only profitable because it went two seasons. Each individual season was not profitable. The vision of the original fair was that it glorified the past. The more recent ones looked to the future. And you can see the duration was only 183 days for the first fair because it went from May to October and the second one went May to October for two years. Chicago actually had a small fair in 1921, which was held at the Municipal Pier, which is now Navy Pier, but it only ran for two weeks. It was held to calm the fears due to gangster violence, the Red Scare, the 1999 race riots, and the economic recession that followed World War I. Because of its success, businessmen and civic citizens, civic leaders proposed another fair. Serious planning began for another fair in 1926. Mayor William Deaver appointed a committee of 150 members of uh, civic leaders and businessmen. Their 1927 report proposed permanent buildings to include a hospital, sports arena, and convention hall. But the idea was dropped when several of the committee members said that Chicago was not interested in such an exposition. The idea was revived in November 1927 by Chauncey McCormick. McCormick was one of the descendants of Robert McCormick, the very wealthy Chicagoan who invented the Reaper. Other members of his committee included Charles Dawes, who was the US Vice President, his brother Rufus, who was an oil tycoon, Daniel Burnham, the younger, who was the son of Daniel Burnham, the architect that proposed the plan of Chicago in 1909, Mrs. McCormick, also a descendant of Robert McCormick, and Lennox Lohr, who was the future president of the National Broadcasting Company. They adopted the name A Century of Progress after rejecting the names Second World's Fair and Chicago Centennial. They couldn't really call it a centennial because Chicago received its charter in, 19, in 1837, so it was not the 100-year mark. The fair would be financed by private funds and not uh, federal or municipal funding. It was an opportunity to rebuild the public's trust in science after their confidence had been eroded by the destruction and death caused by World War I. The unofficial motto of the fair would be, science finds, industry applies, man conforms. The Architectural Commission appointed by Lohr included many prominent architects, including the following. Raymond Hood was in New York City, 
but he was the architect who designed the Tribune Tower on Michigan Avenue. Hollerberg was one of the co-developers of the Magnificent Mile and designed many buildings around Chicago. Edward Bennett was Daniel Burnham, the elder's partner, and he designed the bridge that goes over the Chicago River at Michigan Avenue. Daniel Burnham, the younger, and Hubert Burnham, Daniel, the younger's brother, and they were joined by Lewis Skidmore and Nathaniel Owings, the founders of Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, the firm that was the architect for uh, uh, 875 Michigan Avenue, formerly the Hancock Center, and the Sears Tower, which is now the Willis Tower. The architects would be responsible for a particular area of the fairgrounds, not specific buildings. And the emphasis would be on streamlined surfaces, unadorned exteriors, bright colors, and new building materials, and nighttime illumination. The fair would be called the Rainbow City and not the monochromatic Beaux-Arts of, of pattern of the previous World's Fair. Artificial light would be an inherent component with few, if any, windows in the buildings. The Depression era required that buildings be uh, be built with economic materials. So there was no imported uh, wood pattern, uh, wood paneling or uh, expensive metal paneling. Instead, they used asbestos, cement board, sheet metal, masonite, gypsum board, and plywood. There would be flat surfaces without ornamentation, as you can see in the building on the right. John Urban was head of the design. He had previously been the head designer for the New York's Metropolitan Opera. He selected 24 colors for the buildings, and the colors were believed to be the future of American commerce in such businesses as the Martex linens, Aero shirts, General Motors cars, and Kohler plumbing. A special paint was developed to withstand Chicago's weather so that it would dry quickly and adhere to the gypsum board. 15,000 gallons of paint were used in 33 days. Visitor, visitors might gasp at the colors on the fairgrounds, but then when they returned to the city, they might wonder why the city looked so drab. Some thought that the colors might cause eye strain or even pus formation in the eyes. The site was along the lakefront uh, and included Northerly Island, which is not really an island, it's a peninsula shown in the lake on the right in this picture. The fairground was three and a half miles long and 80, 899 feet at its widest point. It included 427 acres, which were mostly landfill done after the 1871 fire. The fairgrounds extended to 12th place at approximately the uh, Soldier Field uh, down south to 38th Street. This is a picture of the northern end of the fair site looking southeast. And you can see starting on the left, a uh, mid part of the uh, picture, you can see the Adler Planetarium and then going to the right, Shedd Aquarium, Field Museum, and then just above the Field Museum, uh, just south of the Field Museum, you can see Soldier Field. This is a picture of the south end of the fair site. The travel and transport building is in the foreground with the purple arrow, and it was designed by a team of Edward Bennett, Hubert Burnham, and John Holliberg, and is perhaps the most memorable structure at the fair. Northerly Island was a man-made island or a man-made peninsula, which was part of Daniel Burnham's unfinished 1909 plan of Chicago. He had proposed several islands and peninsulas along the lakefront to encourage water sports. Northerly Island later became the Miggs Field Airport and is now a nature sanctuary. All the buildings on the fair site were demolished by, 18, by 1936. And here we see a picture of Northerly Island. The one on the left is 1953 and you can see Miggs Field. On the right, you see the appearance in 2012 after Mayor Richard M. Daley had the airport demolished. The fair opened on May 27th, 1933, and this is a picture of opening day. It was planned during boom times, but it opened during the Great Depression, and it symbolized Chicago's can-do spirit. People were upbeat when they went to the fair. 
although one quarter of the labor force of Chicago was out of work, and many relied on Al Capone's soup kitchens for their food. The fair was a combination of science and circus. The motto was science finds, industry applies, and man conforms. One aim of the fair was to uh, restore the public's confidence in science, which as I said, had been eroded by the destruction and death of, of the weapons of World War I. This was also done to convince uh, citizens that scientists and businessmen could work together to improve America's lifestyle. The House of Tomorrow, shown on the right, predicted the average American would soon enjoy conveniences like air conditioning, dishwashers, and other labor-saving devices. You can see in the picture on the right side, a car coming out of the garage, and on the left side, an airplane coming out of the garage. There are many entertainment venues. Perhaps the emphasis was on entertainment and not education. The sky ride was 219 feet above the ground. There was an enchanted aisle for children, an auditorium developed by Ripley of Ripley's Believe It or Not, which was like old time sideshows. Sally Rand, a silent screen actress, uh, performed at the streets of Paris. There was a Darkest Africa exhibit, which openly ridiculed African Americans, and a village of little people, which was highly exploitative. But unlike the 1893 fair, there was no women's pavilion. It has been said that the fair was more crass than class, and it was largely exploitative. Uh, at the auditorium uh, developed by Ripley, uh, people swallowed light and regurgitated light bulbs, smoked a pipe through their eyes, turned their head 180 degrees, and children with limb deformities were on display. The midway, as seen here on the right, uh, was lined with uh, nude shows. They had pie eating contests for 400 monkeys. And there was a psychograph machine, which resembled a beauty parlor hair dryer, which was said to measure character traits and psychological hangups. One of the most popular exhibits was the streets of Paris. And this was a reproduction of one of the Parisian streets. It included dining, an exhibit of fine wines, musical performances, and a diving exhibit by Olympic athletes. But perhaps the main reason for the popularity of the exhibit was film actress Sally Rand and her peekaboo fan dance. She was arrested four times on a single day uh, due to perceived indecent exposure. Her dance was originally a spoof on Chicago's high society women who overdressed during the depression when many women could had a difficult time buying any kind of clothing. The first all-star baseball game was held during the 1933-34 World's Fair. And this is a picture of Babe Ruth hitting a home run. The first college all-star game of pitting the best college players against the pro champions was held. But all was not rosy. There were over a thousand cases of amoebic dysentery during the fair in 33, resulting in 98 deaths. The outbreak was, was uh, traced to a defective plumbings in two hotels where sewage was contaminating the drinking water. During the 1893 fair, there was a smallpox outbreak, even though the vaccine was available and uh, was uh, 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 used in the majority of people. But still, the unvaccinated broke out of smallpox, and the epidemic in 1893 was not controlled until 1894. The fair was extended another season from May to October 1934. Uh, the fair encouraged Americans to spend money and modernize everything, including their houses and cars. President Roosevelt believed that the fair would uh, lead to spending on durable goods and therefore jumpstart the economy. And he urged Dawes to reopen the fair again in 1934. Henry Ford saw the publicity his rival General Motors was receiving. So he opened his own exhibit in 1934, shown here on the right. But there was very little African-American participation, except for a reproduction of Dussault's cabin. There were very few exhibits highlighting the contributions African-Americans had made to Chicago. There were several exhibits such as Darkest Africa, which openly ridiculed African-Americans. And despite early promises, African-Americans were discriminated against in hiring 
and sometimes refuse service. Plans for an exhibit highlighting the accomplishments of African Americans never materialized. So African Americans opened their own exhibit about two miles south of the fairgrounds at the Pythian Temple in Chicago's Bronzeville area. This was the largest building in the United States financed, designed, and built by Black people. The NAACP helped extend the fair into the 1934 season by securing legislation that forbade discrimination on the fairgrounds. Florence Price, a uh, African-American female composer, uh, was the first African-American woman to have her composition performed by a major orchestra. This was done in conjunction with the fair uh, performed by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in 1934. What remains of the fair? Well, the legacy has mostly disappeared. All the buildings have been removed. Only one building re remains from the 1893 fair, the Museum of Science and Industry. The Balbo Monument was given to Chicago by Mussolini in 1934 to commemorate Italo Balbo's transatlantic flight. And it still remains. You can see in the picture in the upper right corner, uh, the monument with Soldier Field in the background. Bobo landed with a fleet of uh, his colleagues in seaplanes on Lake Michigan. He was given a key to the city. He was a guest of honor at a Drake Hotel uh, gala, but he was a fascist politician and leader of the Black Shirts, and he was uh, considered to be possibly a successor to Mussolini. There have been several attempts uh, to have this monument removed, but it still remains in the park near Soldier Field. It uh, marks the spot where the uh, Italian exhibit was during the World's Fair. One of the four stars on Chicago's flag represents a century of progress. The other three being Fort Dearborn, the 1871 fire, the uh, Columbian Exposition, and also the century of progress. Will there be any more uh, uh, World's Fairs in the future? Well, they offer fantasy, which has now been taken over by other mediums, including theme parks, movies, museums, and the internet. The fairs are often nationalistic, assuring the host country of its greatness, but the Olympic Games now fulfill this purpose. Since the end of the Cold War, there's been a perceived uh, decreased need in the United States for a World's Fair, but they are still popular in Europe and Asia. Minnesota made a bid for the 2023 fair with the theme, Healthy People, Healthy Planet, but they lost out to Argentina. But our, uh, the United States has renewed its bid for a 2027 fair. In the future, World's Fairs will be called World Expos instead of World's Fairs. Well, let's get together again, virtually again next month. In the meanwhile, stay healthy, stay connected, and I look forward to our virtual meeting next month.